through the school as soon as we can, as fast as we can, because we have a crisis. There's a war on. We can't process all these students. So he invents the Kansas silent reading test. It sounds kind of like the tests we give kids now, right? Draw a line around the word cow. No other answer is right. Even if a line drawn under the word cow, the exercise is wrong and nothing counts. Right? Stop at once when time. No wonder we all know, without me saying it, to write silently and alone. Right? By 1926, the Scholastic after, um, uh, the SAT Foundation is formed and makes this test of lower order thinking the law of the land for college admission. Meanwhile, Frederick Kelly is appalled. He's like, no, 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 no. That was, that was an emergency measure. I wrote in a crisis. I thought I was solving a crisis. It's a terrible time of, form of testing. He was a Deweyite. He was hired as president of the University of Idaho. He was so excited he could do this experimental, interactive, think and do, make and learn kind of Deweyite testing. He's fired within two years. They thought they'd hired the father of standardized scientific testing. They didn't want this Deweyite. He spent his whole life protesting this form of testing. And of course, it's what we use now to measure everything, right? And that colors so much of our mode of thinking. What I'm going to argue is that apparatus worked for the 20th century, but it is not the best way to pay attention in a connected age. Further, our students know that. Our students know there's a mismatch between the kind of learning they use in their everyday life and the kind of learning that our contemporary schools are modeled on today. Right? I think if there's intention problems in our classrooms, it's partly because we're such a mismatch between the ways we teach and the ways our students learn everywhere except at school. Right? Um, I think there's also a mismatch in our own sense of what we have to do to be responsible as teachers. And this is my fault. Right? I'm a college teacher. Until we change, there's no way high schools can, or K through 12 can responsibly change, right? Because you're training kids to go to college, right? When I, absolutely, I have huge empathy, and it's one of the reasons I spend so much of my time talking both to colleges and to K through 12. I also spend a lot of time talking to corporations, and I hear the same thing over and over again. When I talk to people who are hiring the most brilliant new graduates from our colleges, and in this economy, they can hire phenomenal students, students who've worked so hard to get their A pluses on everything, to take all those AP classes, to do all those extracurricular activities, who worked so hard. I, there's no way I could have gotten into a college um, the, today with the kind of standards our, our students face today. I was just recently at the University of California at Irvine and learned the median grade of an entering freshman at UC Irvine this year is 4.1 on a 4.0 scale. That's appalling to me. That's a, that's, that should not be. You shouldn't have to be better than perfect to get into a state school. Right? That's just, it's wrong. So what do the college recruiters tell me? They say in the old days, meaning five years ago. It used to take about six months to take the best, best, best student and get them to stop thinking like a student who had a professor up there somewhere who was going to give them an A and to get them start thinking like a responsible adult. So the first time I heard this comment, I said, okay, so what do you mean by a responsible adult? They said, because to be a great worker, you don't have to guess the right answer from a limited supply of answers. You have to be able to say, whoa, I have no idea what the answer is. I have the resources to get that answer. I'm going to go talk to so-and-so or so-and-so, or I'm going to go online. I'm going to get that information. And I admit, I don't have it. What, re what corporate recruiters tell me now is it takes a minimum of one year and sometimes two years to make that transition. Because the students are so frightened of getting it wrong. So frightened of not circling the right po one possible correct answer. Uh, among four. I showed you the Frederick Kelly example of the cow. And I was thinking if my kid, my kids are grown up, if my grandchild were to come home now and tell me that they got the cow answer wrong. So let's say somebody said, their teacher said, which of these, and this is also in Kelly's test, 
uh, Kelly's dissertation. Which of these four animals is a farm animal? A, cow, B, elephant, C, dog, uh, E, dinosaur. And if my student wrote dog and got it wrong, if my kid wrote dog and got it wrong, and they came home crying to me and they said, but there's, dogs are farm animals. Why is that the wrong answer? I would have, I, what would I do as a good parent? I'd say, well, let's go online and read about farm animals, right? Do you know what, how many responses you get if you put in farm animals on Google? 14,973 responses. I looked it up this morning. It's hard to imagine what about A, dog, B, cow, prepares you for a world where there's over 14 million responses to farm animals. And the number one hit for farm animals on the Google rankings is this fabulous site. It's a beautiful, beautiful site called Farm Kids. It's done by educators. And most parents who looked at it would think, this is a perfect site for my kid. I happened to play it with a kid, so I didn't just look to see if it was a perfect site. We were on the site for about 20 minutes. No adult looks at their kid's site for 20 minutes. Guess what happens at, 20, at minute 20 of Farm Kids, this fantastic site? It starts getting very sludgy and slowing down, and a pop-up comes up. And it says, if you're, slight, if you're getting this pop-up, go ask mommy to download the most recent edition of the Internet Explorer. And if you read in the documentation, it makes it clear. This is a Microsoft product. It doesn't work well with Apple after 20 minutes. And in fact, it doesn't work well with a Mozilla browser either. It's a commercial. Right? What about which of these four animals is a farm animal prepares our children for that world where there are 14 possible responses. You have to know how to sort through all that information. And a lot of it is a commercial. And it's taking your data too. Right? If you had to register, it's also taking your data. And probably the next time you go online, you're going to have little pop-ups advertising books about farm animals. Right? We've all had that experience. So what do we do? How do we learn to pay attention in a connected age? I'm going to talk about a few things. Oh, sorry. These are the kinds of keywords I think we have to replace the 19th century industrial word, words with. We're not talking anymore about timelessness and the punch clock. We're talking about just in time and any time. IBM invented the punch clock. 40%, 40% of IBM workers in 2013 use a punch clock. IBM almost went broke in the 19, 1990s, and they switched to a whole different system called endeavor-based work that's more like a movie set where people work in teams, they work in global teams, they're constantly working new jobs. Most people work from home, right? So the company, the only behemoth manufacturing company from the 19th century to still survive in the 21st century, has already gone through a huge revelation, revolution in its own sense of time. Our school days are still mostly based in the 19th century that does not pair, repair people for the IBM of today. Hierarchy versus network contribution. How do you learn to work well with other people? How do you learn to think and then pair and share? Right? I think, as I said, I use think, pair, share in every single class every day when I go into classes. We do a think, pair, share exercise. Sometimes we start with it. Sometimes we end with it. Sometimes we do it in the middle. How you learn to contribute. How you learn to negotiate with somebody else is a huge skill that we're not so good at teaching. Sustainability, what makes a sustainable um, rather than a productive life? Customization and iteration, I love this. You know, the adage of the internet is publish first, edit later. Wow, where in our school lives do we have room for publish first, edit later? Meaning get it out there and then see how people respond to it and then make it better based on how people respond to it. The, the law of the internet. Peer evaluation and feedback. When I teach classes now, my students invent the syllabus, they give the assignments, they grade the assignments, the students give them uh, students teacher evaluations, they do it in teams of four, and the next week they're back as students again and four other people are running the class. So it's a constantly, not just about content, but about evaluation itself. Because I realize my students are very worried about getting feedback because feedback means a B plus instead of an A and that means you don't get into Duke, right? Again, I'm sure 
I'm preaching to the choir here, right? Um, I have my own colleagues at Duke complaining all the time about students grade grubbing, right? How come they think a B plus is a bad grade? Well, we live in a world where you have to have a 4.1 to get into a state university in your state. Of course we've taught them that grade grubbing is the only way to succeed if you get a grade below perfect. Collaboration by difference is exactly the model of the Han, where you learn not to see other people as deficient, but to see what strengths are and how you work with other people's strengths. And then te from teaching to learning, learning how to learn. We don't have a knowledge shortage anymore. Anyone can get knowledge. So how do you learn to get knowledge? How do you learn to find the knowledge you need in the world you live in? Talk about five things that we can do now to shift the paradigm. And I'm going to talk today not about systemic things that none of us feel like we can do, but some really simple things. Excuse me. These are all examples from my friends and colleagues that just blow me away, and they're all pretty simple. And I'm sure there are hundreds of you in this room today already do some of these, but I hope these are ideas that might spark others as well to think about how what you're already doing, in fact, can help and can be translated and help your students think about how this prepares them for their future outside of school. One, rethink liberal arts as a startup curriculum for resilient global citizens. I'm a huge, huge believer in a liberal arts foundation. My sense from now having spent time in hundreds of schools, K through professional school, so we do a really poor job of linking those liberal arts to one another, to specialized knowledge, and to the life outside of school. And uh, I just, last week at dinner, heard this amazing story from a friend of mine. I'm not going to use his name. He's one of the most famous cultural theorists in the world uh, um, who teaches a, a philosophy class from Descartes to Deleuze, a survey class. And he tried to get his 17-year-old son, who's busily applying, actually not applying for college. He's biting his nails, waiting to hear that April date when they're all hearing about college. And my friend Larry said to his son, you know, you, what do you think about these philosophers? And, and Zach said, well, this, it's interesting. They're interesting, but they're irrelevant to my life. And Larry said, no, they're important in your life. And Zach, the 17-year-old from the Mouse of Babes, said, I bet when you teach your class, you never tell your students why it's important in their life. I bet you never have your students tell you. And Larry changed his teaching. He now goes three classes where he teaches a Descartes, a Kant, a Hegel. And the third class is only for the students. He doesn't talk. And he asks each student to talk about how in the previous week they used one of the teachings from one of those great philosophers to think about a complex solution, situation in their own lives. That's not huge, but I actually have never heard of anybody who teaches the great philosophers in that way. And what Larry said is he was dumbfounded because not only did his students come up with examples, but the second time they did it, they were primed. They knew it was going to happen, and they had examples. Like He said it was the best, it turned out this was a recent conversation, he said the best discussion he heard about sequestration from anybody, not NPR, anyone, was from his students who were talking about Kant and society and social obligation and social trust and applying it to sequestration. That is not a hard thing to do, but that making of connection is exactly the kind of preparation we all need to be doing for the world our students live in online, out of school, and the world they're going to live in after school. Move from critical thinking to creative contribution. Boy, I am the worst offender here. I spent 20 years of my life saying critical thinking is important. Critical thinking is important. You know, to, uh, to generations of doctoral students, we'd read an article and they'd learn to rip it apart. Right? That, there's ideology in that. There's fallacious thinking in that. And I'd wonder why they were pa paralyzed when suddenly they'd sit down to write their own dissertations. I really think we have to go back to being more of a maker culture. Right? More of a culture where we don't just think critically about ideas, but we do something with those ideas. We translate them into an action. It teaches humility, humility first of all. Right? It's hard to do, to do something that's pure. 
It's a lot easier to see where somebody else failed than to try to do something for yourself. I personally think it's crazy that every four-year-old isn't learning to code, right? We live in the internet age. You don't train people in reading, writing, and arithmetic because they're going to become professional writers or accountants or tax specialists. You do it because it's a tool for living in your world. We live in a world that's built with an open architecture that allows anyone to contribute, and we're not teaching kids code. Plus, iterative maker thinking, code thinking, is a process you build on. There are wonderful programs like Scratch out there. I don't know how many of you um, have kids who learn Scratch or do where you learn. Isn't it great? It's a free program by MIT um, Media Lab. It's open source. Kids learn code online, and they're making man animations, and they're making storybooks, and they're making superheroes, and they're playing with their friends, and they're learning iterative thinking that you can build on, not math by rote. I've got another lecture about how we're doing, where our emphasis on STEM is creating a generation of kids who hate STEM thinking. It's because we're taking the curiosity and the passion out of our math and science. Three, make sure what you value is what you count. What about creativity? What about um, critical contribution and creative contribution? What about originality? Um, when my students, I, I mentioned that my students always work in groups and they run my class. I also do management lessons with them that are exactly the same lessons I'm going to do with the Cisco Board of Directors next week. Right? And one thing they do is they work individually and award peer badges for certain qualities. And we often, I often have the students decide what those qualities are. Leadership, the fire starter, the kid in the group who makes up, comes up with the idea when everybody else is brain dead, the implementer, the finisher. Right? These are really important qualities. Where do they appear on ABCD grading? Right? We know those are important life skills. Where do, we, where do those count? Um, I've been privileged to be part of the MacArthur Foundation's um, digital media and learning competitions every year. And this year, we're fo focusing on badges for lifelong learning as a new system of allowing people to give credit for all aspects of their life. Uh, badges for vets, for example, are helping badges, vets who are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq to really think about all the skills they have. They might not have even um, have any college skills, but making a resume from the array of skills they have using badging. But the important thing is not how you do it, but that you count, you think together with your students about what you value and figure out ways to make that count. I also have my students write a class constitution for every class. What do we want to learn? What do we want to do in this class? What do we accomplish? What are our rules for the class? Sometimes we use the US Constitution. This time we use the Mani Mozilla Manifesto, and they write it for our class. They rewrite it for our class. This, by the way, is a, um, a comic by Nick Sasanis, who is a student at Columbia Teachers College, who's writing the first ever comic book uh, a dissertation on comics as a comic. That was fun, trying to get that approved by Columbia. But it's going to happen. And I think that's important. It exemplifies the idea of counting and valuing together. Find creative ways to model unlearning. Right. We've been doing um, musicals uh, at Duke with teams of high school students, college students, and, and elderly people in the conv a convalescent home called the Forest at Duke. Uh, recently, one of the students said, hey, I don't think all of our cast members are going to make it this year. Talk about a learning experience, right? Trying to make a musical. They're making a romance about a Duke and a Carolina, Carolina students who couldn't be lovers when they were in school because they were playing, one played for, one was at Carolina and one was at Duke, which hate each other, right? And they come back in the nursing home and they fall in love. So, and then they've got young people playing them at different parts of their career, all the way back to childhood. But they're also learning about what, about ability and disability, illness and health in a very, very powerful way that isn't about the normal rules of being 22 years old. My favorite, take institutional change personally. Media analyst Clay Shirky says, institutions tend to preserve the problems they were created to solve. He's kind of right about that. But Tom Friedman, Friedman says, big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what's desperately necessary. My Haystack co-founder and I, uh, David Thiel Goldberg, have a much more op optimistic definition. We say institutions are mobilizing networks. By that we mean at every grumpy faculty room where you're complaining, you have the basis 
for working together to try to change your institution in ways big and small. And my favorite story about that doesn't come from education sector at all. In the town of Greensboro, North Carolina, a developer named Dennis Quaintance had twins. He and his wife had twins in their 40s, when they were in their 40s, and decided the next time he built a hotel, he wanted to make it sustainable so his kids would admire him. Dennis does not have, I don't even know if he has a high school diploma. He certainly doesn't have a college diploma, and none of his workers have any kind of education. He said, let's go online and figure out how to make a sustainable hotel. They had to change state laws to get approval for their hotel because nobody in North Carolina was doing sustainable development. At some point, the lead people who give out those lead designations heard about them and came and followed what they were doing and saw how they had tracked what they were doing. They gave the Proximity Hotel in Greensboro, North Carolina by workers who had never, never, never learned how to do this except online, the country's first and only platinum lead designation. When I asked Dennis what the moral of that story was, he said two things. One, isn't it great that 80 guys and, ga and gals in Greensboro, North Carolina can learn online how to make the country's only platinum lead sustainable hotel? And then the opposite. He said it wasn't that hard. If we can do it, why isn't everybody else? It's a big question. It's a question we all have to ask ourselves in every aspect of our lives. Why? It's not that hard. Here's my scary slide. Knowledge is out there. We're no longer purveyors of knowledge. If we teachers can be replaced by a computer screen, we should be. It's cheaper online. Knowledge is abundant online. Who needs us? I need us. We all need us. I mean this not to say we can be replaced by a computer screen, but we have to fight. We have to fight for what we do in the classroom. We have to fight that that experience is something that absolutely no computer can replace. Right? That our life in the classroom is so vital, what we do in the classroom can't be replaced anywhere by any system, by any machine. We count. And you know how I know that? because you've all written it on your cards. That's the takeaway. We're already there. You've already done it. You're here in this room. You're together. Institutions are mobilizing networks, and I know you have it. You know what it is. You know what you have to do. We all do. We can do. We can't be replaced by computer screens. I'm honored to have spent this time with you in your closing event of what I've heard is a wonderful conference. You have a big job ahead, but I know we can do it. It's on your card. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so very My much. pleasure. My pleasure.